The other day I was out on the Blue Ridge Parkway on my motorcycle and I stopped to film this sunset. And I'm going to use this setting as an intro for our next uh, video. We're going to be looking at the book of John, chapter 2, and reading the story of when Jesus cleansed the temple. And after he had done this, he told the Jews, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now what does he mean by that? He also clarifies things to the disciples later, saying he was talking about the temple of his body. Again, what is this talking about? Let's open the Bible and read what it has to say and see if we can find out more information about what Jesus was referring to. We're going to start today in John chapter 2, reading verses 13 through 22, starting with verse 13. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, also the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the money changers' money and overthrew the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away from me. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of your house has eaten me up. Then the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show us since you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, This temple was forty-six years building, and will you rear it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So let's look at verse 19. They asked for a sign. Why did Jesus do this? What authority did he have to do this? And this is what he said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews thought he was talking about the temple that was their place of worship. But in John 2.21, he says he spoke of the temple of his body. So let's see if we can understand this. First of all, we need to understand the temple, the building of the temple, and what it is all about. So let's turn to Exodus chapter 25 and let's look at verses 8 and 9. And this is God speaking and he's speaking to Moses and it says in verse 8, And let them make me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you. The pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments of it, even so you shall make it. So here God is telling Moses, make me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among you. He wanted to be among his people, the people that worshipped him and followed him. But notice in Exodus 25, 9, he already has a pattern of the tabernacle that Moses is to follow. And how to make the uh, tabernacle and the instruments thereof in it. So, not only was the purpose of the sanctuary to provide a dwelling place for God to be among them, but it's also representative of the gospel story. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 4, and let's look at verses 32 through 35. Now, this whole text is about laws for the sin offering. And this last few verses we're going to look at, starting with verse 32. And if he brings a lamb for a sin offering, he shall bring a female without blemish. And he shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and kill it for a sin offering in the place where he kills the burnt offering. And the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering. And he shall pour out all its blood at the bottom of the altar. And he shall take away all of the fat of it, as the fat of the lamb is taken away from the sacrifice of the peace offerings. 
and the priest shall burn them on the altar, on the fire, offerings to Jehovah. And the priest shall make an atonement for his sin that he has sinned, and it shall be forgiven him. This sin offering, among all the other services of the tabernacle in the Old Testament, represented what Christ would come to this earth and do. It pointed forward to the events of when Christ was on this earth, when he would be slain on the cross. And so the tabernacle, the building tabernacle, the Jews said took 46 years to build, all pointed to the sacrifice that Jesus was about to make. Let's go to John chapter 1, and we're going to look at what John the Baptist has to say about Jesus. We're going to look at verses 29 through 34. The next day, John sees Jesus coming to him and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I have said, After me comes a man who has been before me, for he preceded me. For I did not know him, but that he be revealed to Israel, therefore I have come baptizing with water. And John bore record, saying, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and abode on him. And I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water, that one said to me, Upon whom ye shall see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I saw and bore record that this is the Son of God. So Jesus, John considered the Lamb of God who takes away the sin in the world. And he also said Jesus is the Son of God. And so when you think about the sanctuary services of the temple, the building temple in, in Jesus' time, they all pointed to the sacrifice that he was about to make. It was the gospel story that was witnessed to the children of Israel in living color. Let's continue on to the book of Hebrews. And we're going to go to chapter 9 and read verses 1 through 15. Starting in verse 1. Then truly the first tabernacle, that one in the wilderness, had also ordinances of divine service and an earthly sanctuary. For the first tabernacle was repaired in which was both the lampstand and the table and the setting out of the loaves, which is called holies. And after the second veil was a tabernacle, which is called the Holy of Holies, having a golden censer, altar of incense, and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid all around with gold, in which was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And over it were the cherubims of glory overshadowing the mercy seat, about which we cannot speak piece by piece. Now when these things were ordained in this way, the priest always went into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. But once in the year into the second, the high priest goes alone, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Spirit signifying by this that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. For it was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sac sacrifices that could not make him who did the surface perfect as regards to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and different kinds of washing and fleshly ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. This is all talking about that first tabernacle in the wilderness, as well as the um, Solomon's temple and the temple in Jesus' time. But when Christ, verse 11, when, but when Christ had become a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, 
not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, nor by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once for all into the holies, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause is the mediator of the new covenant, so that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were made under the first covenant, these who are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. All these ordinances and the services in the tabernacle, in the wilderness, Solomon's temple, and the temple that Herod built during Jesus' day, all pointed to what Christ would do. But they were unable to do what Christ's blood could do. They couldn't purge the conscience. They could only sanctify to the purifying of the flesh in verse 13. Let's go back to John two, nineteen. And again, it says, Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He knew that the Jewish leaders were seeking to kill him. But what the Jews didn't understand is by destroying Christ through the crucifixion on the cross, they were destroying the services or putting an end to the services of the building temple and also the work that they were assigned to do. Because after Christ's death, when he was raised up after three days, he now is our high priest in the temple or the sanctuary in heaven. Let's look at a couple of verses that helps us um, explain that. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 22 through 32. Starting with verse 22. This is Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. Men, Israelites, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by, of God among you by powerful works and wonders and miracles, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know. This one, speaking of Christ, given to you by the before-determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by lawless hands crucified him, you put him to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David speaks concerning of him, I foresaw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore my heart rejoiced, my tongue was glad, and also my flesh shall rest in hope, because you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You revealed to me the ways of life, and you f will fill me with your joy, with your countenance. And here Peter explains David wasn't talking about himself, but he was quoting Christ. Men, brothers, it is permitted to say to you with plainness as to the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit upon his throne. Seeing this beforehand, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, and his soul was not left in Hades, nor would his flesh see corruption. God has raised up this Jesus, of which we are all witnesses. Let's go to the book of Luke, chapter 23, and I want to read verses 45 and 46. 
This is at the death of Christ, the crucifixion of the cross. And listen to what it says here. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in the middle. And crying with a loud voice, Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed out the spirit. At the death of Christ, the veil in the temple, the veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place, was torn in two, from top to bottom, in the middle. And this represents the end of the services of the temple or the sanctuary because they all pointed to what Christ was to accomplish not only at the cross, but after his resurrection. So let's continue and look at Ephesians chapter 2 and we're going to read verses 13 through 22. But now in Christ, you who were once afar off are made near by the blood of Christ. He's talking about the Gentiles that were afar off at one time. That they are made near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, he making us both one. He has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Speaking of the Jews and Gentiles, making them both one. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity the law of commandments contained in ordinances so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, making peace between them, and so that he might reconcile both to God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity in himself. Now look at verse 15. We're going to continue on in a minute, but let's look at verse 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the Law of Commandments contained in ordinances. This is talking about the services of the temple. All these command services that God told them to follow all pointed towards the death of Christ. And he abolished or fulfilled them in his flesh when he died on the cross. Since they all pointed to that event, there was no longer a need for them. As well as there was, there was no longer a need for the priests in those sanctuary, because now Christ would become our high priest when he was resurrected. But not only this, let's continue on in verse 16. So that he might, might reconcile both to God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity in himself. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and those who were near, the Gentiles and the Jews. For through him we, have, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom every building, having been fitly framed together, grows into a holy sanctuary in the Lord, in whom you are also built together for a dwelling place of God through the Spirit. Remember, we had looked at Exodus, and God told Moses that he wanted to have him build a sanctuary so that I could dwell among you. Now that Christ has risen from the dead, he has raised up a sanctuary to God, with himself being the chief cornerstone, having built us fitly framed together into a holy sanctuary in the Lord for a dwelling place of a God through the Spirit. Paul talks about, don't you know that your body is the temple of God. So even though in John chapter 2, Jesus was talking about the temple of his body, it also had an effect and implications to that 
building temple that the Jews thought he was talking about in reality, it also had a, an effect on that as well. Let's continue on in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8. And we're going to read verses 1 through 10. Verse 1, Now the sum of things which we have spoken is this, We have such a high priest who has sat down on the right of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Therefore it is necessary that this one having have something to offer also. For if indeed he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law, who serve the example and the shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was warned of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he says, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown to you in the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. By so much he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which was built upon better promises. For if the first covenant had been without fault, then no place would have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord. I will make an end to the house of Israel, and on the house of Judah a new covenant shall be. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took hold of, the, of their hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not regard them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The beginning of the section in chapter 8, we read that Christ is our high priest, a minister in the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man, which is in heaven. And that the pattern that was shown to Moses is a pattern of the heavenly sanctuary. And the reason that the first covenant is being done away with is not because there's anything with, wrong with the law of God. In verse 9, we see it's because the children of Israel did not continue in my covenant and I did not regard them, says the Lord. But look at this new covenant in verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them in their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. You notice the law isn't done away with. It's just in a different location. Instead of having the law written on a tablet of stones and put in the Ark of the Covenant, now these laws are written into our minds and on our hearts so that we will be God's people and He will be our God. And this is done and accomplished all through Christ. So let's go back to John 2 and we'll just kind of review what we've talked about. John chapter 2, and we're going to read again verses 18 through 21. Then the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show us since you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, This temple was 46 years building, and Will you rear it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. The Jews had decided they were going to kill Jesus. And in destroying Christ's life with crucifixion on the cross, they ended 
the need for the temple and its services because they all pointed to that event. And thus, and thus when Jesus said, in three days I will raise it up, when God, the Father of Christ, raised Christ up out of the grave, he now has become our high priest in the temple, the sanctuary in heaven. But not only is he our high priest, but he is offering a better offering than what was offered in the services of the earthly temple. Because the blood of bulls and goats couldn't purify the mind, couldn't purify the conscience. But the blood of Christ does. Not only that, it is through Christ who is our cornerstone, he builds us into a sanctuary for the dwelling place of God. And thus, he is talking about the temple of his body that was raised up out of the grave after three days. I hope this is helpful. I hope you continue to study this subject because it's in very much the story of the gospel. The Jews had a living example of what the gospel was about. Unfortunately, they didn't believe it. And when Jesus Christ came, the Son of God came to this earth, most of them refused to believe in him. But now we have this new covenant, a covenant which Christ is the mediator of, where God will put his laws into our hearts and minds, and we will be his people and he will be our God. Again, I hope you continue to study these things and may God bless you as you study his word.